In 2010, the Stuxnet computer worm took advantage of a hole in the Windows operating system to infect the computers at an Iranian uranium enrichment facility. This worm was no ordinary computer virus. It was designed to find and attack the software controlling the speed of the facility's centrifuges, causing them to self-destruct. Cyber experts say Stuxnet is so complex and sophisticated, it must have been designed by a state-level actor. That actor, experts say, was most likely the United States, Israel, or both. Whatever the case, Stuxnet represented a new generation of cyber weapon and opened a new frontier in cyber warfare and cyber intelligence. So, at its most basic, the function of intelligence is to obtain information to help protect the country, your nation. Well, there have been several intelligence failures in recent times. Failure to predict the Iranian Revolution was one. The fall of the Berlin Wall was another. The Arab Spring, yet, yet a further one. But of course, the most disastrous of all was the failure to predict the uh, attacks by Al Qaeda on the US mainland in 2001. So the Soviet Union collapsed, not all at once, basically between 1989, with the fall of the satellite states in Eastern Europe, to the formal dissolution of the USSR in 1991. And that ushered in a brief period of, well, sort of, on the one hand, Western triumphalism. See, we were right all along. Our ideas were victorious. We said the Soviet Union would collapse. Well, and, and eventually it has. And this ushered in this period in which you had people like Francis Fukuyama and others writing about the end of history. You know, which for historians is kind of a bad idea. After the Cold War and its set of conventions and confrontations ends, it wasn't so much that unique new threats emerged for the United States in terms of security, but rather some earlier patterns reasserted themselves. Now, terrorism as a threat, hijackings, hostage crises, as well as conventional regional wars became an issue once again. They reasserted themselves after the Cold War confrontation. And earlier confrontation lines became more ambiguous. This led to uh, new alliances, new unexpected uh, alignments. Uh, and in particular, in the Middle East, factors of terrorism asserted themselves in dramatic and horrifying ways that the Cold War confrontation had not allowed. The CIA's reputation takes a big hit in the 80s, especially the year 1985. This is when a high-profile, high-level Soviet defector, Vitaly Yachenko, redefects to the Soviet Union because he hasn't been joined by his girlfriend and wants to go back. And in the process, reveals the existence of a mole in the CIA, Edward Lee Howard, who is being surveilled by the FBI, but manages to flee New Mexico to, uh, to Moscow. Also in 1985, he and his wife sort of use tradecraft that they have learned in, within the CIA, such as using a dummy in the passenger seat of their car to, to persuade the FBI that actually he is in it. In fact, he's elsewhere. It's stories such as this that compound the damage to the CIA's reputation. By coincidence, 
1985 also happens to be the year, not of his exposure, but it's when the most damaging CIA mole of all time, Aldrich Ames, starts passing secrets to the Soviet Union. He's not detected until later, until 1994, but uh, it, it, it is this coincidence that he happens to start his career as a mole in this same year of embarrassment after embarrassment for US intelligence. So one might suppose that the collapse of the Soviet Union would go down as a victory for the CIA, and it would um, have a good 1990s after that event had occurred. That's not, in fact, what happened. Instead, the agency got a lot of criticism for not having seen the, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc uh, coming. How did all of the tea leaf readers in the West despite claims later on uh, that somehow they magically did, have missed the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union. One is that what was going on there was, was much more an internal matter. What destroyed the Soviet Union was not a poorly run economy. It had always had a pretty poorly run economy. What destroyed the Soviet Union is when its elites lost faith in their religion when they lost faith in the ability of the Communist Party to fulfill their own personal ambitions and to fulfill the good of the country and the population. And that's why they voluntarily went out of business. The other thing you might imagine, the Soviet Union collapsed. Russian intelligence did not. You know, that seems to have pretty much maintained its equilibrium throughout that entire process. It just kind of went on seamlessly. So, for instance, when the Soviet Union went out of business, do you suppose that the former KGB first main director decided that, oh, well, the Cold War is over, so here, we're going to give you the names of all of our, we're going to call back all of our illegals and we'll give you the names of all of our assets and people who are working for us because it's all, no, absolutely not. Those people remained in place. And many of them, like Ames and others, continued to be paid because there was still spying to be done. Because the USSR collapsed, Russia did not. In fact, the 1990s proves to be a period of drift and even sort of demoralization for the agency. It catches criticism for not having uh, predicted, at least in, in detail, the collapse, the forthcoming collapse of uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, it, it's not exactly clear what, it miss, what its mission will be after the end of the, uh, the, the, the Cold War. Would it be nuclear proliferation, drugs, terrorism? There's a lot of rapid changeover in leadership, and its funding is cut. Whole divisions are closed down, stations overseas shuttered. So the 1990s finds the CIA at a surprisingly low ebb in its history. I would argue that a basic flaw in this is that what CIA, MI6, other Western agencies were all based on is it was was fighting the Soviets. That was your that that was what you existed. You you were opposed to their efforts. Could you really conceive of a world in which that wouldn't exist? I mean, can you conceive of God without the devil? And if your reason, if the whole reason your agency exists, if the very reason that it was brought into being and funded and guided and trained and directed was to combat the Soviet menace, and there is no longer a Soviet menace, well, then who needs you anymore? The Soviet involvement over a decade in Afghanistan bore remarkable echoes or, or um, parallels to that of the British invasion of Afghanistan uh, in the 19th century. It was all about influence. It was about having one's clients in control of this strategically pivotal region. And when that control was threatened in 1979, Soviet armed forces moved in and intervened in order to, as the propaganda phrase went, to help the Afghans with security in their own country. The result was that Soviet forces were bogged down 
for a decade in fierce fighting in a landscape that they never managed to control in a series of events that outside observers sometimes called the Soviet's version of Vietnam. Its aftermath was further destabilization of Afghanistan uh, and the self-assertion of uh, radical uh, who would sponsor terrorism. And this would provoke yet further war in the years to come. Terrorist groups have a calculus of what it is they aim to achieve, which differs from that of great power confrontations and the winning of outright wars. Their aim is often to create psychological terror, spectacular events that will intimidate entire societies and to convince people worldwide of the vigor of their terroristic beliefs. All of this is a dynamic that's very different and much harder to contend against than traditional great power rivalry. I think the failure to predict 9-11 can be traced to a number of causes. One was the, the lack of human intelligence about Al-Qaeda and about its leader, Osama bin Laden. There were systemic problems within the American intelligence community, lack of communication, the so-called the wall, especially between uh, the CIA and the FBI, which prevented the sharing of secrets, such as the fact that the CIA knew that two members of Al-Qaeda were in the US on US visas in, in the run-up to the attack, and indeed those two men ended up on the plane and was flown into the Pentagon. Well, after 9-11, there again was when suddenly it seemed that a new enemy had appeared on the scene, out of nowhere, apparently. Of course, it wasn't out of nowhere. That had been brewing for some time. There had been Islamist extremists who had been carrying out an earlier attack on the Trade Center, um, the attack on the USS Cole. Uh, that had been going on for some time. It had just not been recognized. And arguably it had been recognized because of the phenomenon that was later criticized as stovepiping. You know, stovepipe, all the smoke goes and it goes up a single stovepipe. And the idea here was that the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the different intelligence gathering organizations all operated like separate stovepipes and they weren't putting all of the smoke into one big chamber where it could be sifted through. That is a natural safeguard within that situation. It is a necessary safeguard, but it's also a safeguard that carries with it risks. So the idea with 9-11 is that if all of the agencies had been sharing information and all of those pieces had been put together, the plot would have been seen ahead of time and it would never have happened. That itself is a kind of huge assumption. It's not just the intelligence community's fault, though, what happened, because in fact the CIA did provide warnings that bin Laden was intent on attacking the United States uh, in the summer of 2001. Not necessarily very detailed sort of actionable warnings, but, but they did know an attack was coming and they told the Bush White House, but um, it didn't listen because it was, I think, so preoccupied with uh, state actors, with possible threats to the US coming from other governments rather than uh, non-government actors, um, terrorist cells such as Al-Qaeda. So in an ideal scenario, intelligence professionals collect information, analyze it, digest it, make it into good informative intelligence for politicians, for those who make national policy. That's the ideal scenario. This often doesn't happen in practice. And um, to a great extent, of course, the fault lies with the politicians. They're being deluged with information from all quarters. They have political agendas of their own. They ignore perhaps intelligence which doesn't sit with their preferred foreign policy. Um, they, they cherry pick intelligence, so to speak. They, they listen to things that sort of suit predetermined policy outcomes um, rather than actually having an entirely open mind and listening to what the intelligence professionals are telling them. Well, the plan then to deal with stovepiping was to create some sort of arc, our overarching agency then which all of that information can be funneled. And that became the Department of Homeland Security, and the Secretary of Homeland Security. This was the protection of the homeland, and this is where everything was supposed to end up. And I guess the question then comes, what did that work? Are we all safer? 
Will nothing like 9-11 ever happen again? Well, we'll have to wait and see in that regard. I think it's open to question how effective these reforms have been, whether they fixed America's intelligence problems. Some people might say that it's really just an additional layer of uh, bureaucracy and that the, the DNI hasn't actually been that effective uh, in, in practice. And of course, the repercussions of 9-11 wasn't just the tragic loss of life that occurred on the, the day itself. It has fundamentally transformed American intelligence, American foreign relations, the reputation of the United States in the world, and greatly grown the US national security state as well. Surveillance of US citizens is now much greater as a result of 9-11 than, than it had been prior to it. Um, so it's not just a massive event in terms of U.S. foreign relations. It's domestic impact, long-term impact is huge as well. In the history of espionage, there are so many patterns that go back to ancient times. There's so many parallels and, and things that recur. But now, in our own times, 21st century espionage is marked by something new, and that is cyber espionage. It has accelerated trends that were there before. It has introduced new complexities and new challenges as well as threats. By one estimate, in 2010, the U.S. alone spent $80 billion on cyber espionage. That's an order of magnitude uh, that's enormous given the novelty and the significance of this new factor in the history of espionage. So when it comes to science and technology, right now we're living in a really interesting time. Um, probably we're going to see more science and technical change, technological change in our lifetime than our ancestors did during the Industrial Revolution. Right now, there are so many mind-blowing, world-changing technologies that are in rapid development uh, it's, it's hard to wrap our head around. For instance, artificial intelligence is a field of great growth. Quantum computing is a field of great growth. Material science, you know, where we're going to get away from silicone-based chips and boards and that sort of thing. Great growth. And a, a lot of this is being done in the commercial sector. In the old days, a lot of research was done was funded by the government and it was done under the guise of the government or the Defense Department. And these days, vastly outstripped by the, um, the private sector. So the digital age, the internet age, has introduced, I think as we talked about earlier, a whole host of new problems. One of them is, is simply, you know, what are, the, what are the threats that that poses? Uh, the one that will come up a lot is fake news, mis, you know, the, the, the mass spread of disinformation, not misinformation, disinformation, which really is kind of an elaborate way of saying the use of everything from social media to other platforms as, as a means of mass propaganda. So one of the biggest emerging challenges for intelligence analysis has to do with data. You know, when a lot of people think of data, the first thing they think of is social media, for instance, or open source information going back to social media, because so much data is being produced by social media platforms. But really it's data in general. We are living in the age of data. So much data is being made available publicly and various sources. And that can provide answers that we never had access to before, it can provide information that we just couldn't get before. And so now what we're seeing is that intelligence an analysis is getting away from the subjective or the qualitative, where there was a scarcity of facts, and you'd have to make these determinations based around the facts you know, to a more objective or quantifiable analysis, where you're getting a ton of data and you analyze that data to tell you what the objective fact is. As an analyst, I'm here to tell you who grew up in the quantitative, qualitative world, it's fascinating to try to make that change. I think um, the, the incredible ubiquity of communications, uh, social media, et cetera, is, is both good and bad. I mean, I, th I, I think you can, you can organize more quickly whether you can use it for the right purposes, I don't know.
When you look at a lot of the resistance groups that have popped up all over the world against authoritarian governments and how social media contributed to that and, and the rise of hope. And, but then where do you go with it? I mean, I think it's easy for it to happen, but what happens once you get this uprising? What are you going to do with it? And so many times, you know, it's, it's ended so disappointingly. So the interesting thing about technology and the intelligence business is that it's always what we call a two-sided coin. Wherever there's a potential to um, help make our side better, whether it's de defend our communications better or what have you, it also raises an opportunity for offense. And that is that we'll be able to develop stronger, faster cryptographic systems. So for the future of encryption, all eyes are on quantum. Many experts in the quantum field today say that we'll have workable quantum computers in the next 20 years. So what this means is our current cryptologic systems probably will no longer be secure. And that's because a quantum computer is going to allow you to look for those patterns in encrypted communications much more quickly so that you, you know, you can break the, the system. They're saying that it might knock it down to one fifth the amount of time that it would take to break a current system. And one other threat from quantum systems is, you know, once they come about, they'll be able to take old encrypted messages that are still secrets we want to keep, even though they're 10 or 20 years old, and be able to decrypt them. So there, there is this greater chance of the, of the, the use of the, let's say, the, the mass digital platform to spread disinformation. But that's a relative nuisance controlled of what I would argue is the real threat. And the real threat there is in hacking and the shutting down of vital services, you know, like a pipeline that serves the East Coast, air traffic control systems. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine the possibilities of attacks on essential infrastructure, travel, fuel supply, water supplies, food distribution, not to mention the electrical power grid. Governments are investing heavily in entire infrastructures of sophisticated hacking and deploying, uh, they hope, deniable forms of cyber attacks against their enemies, constantly probing for vulnerabilities and weaknesses, trying to evade detection, all in preparation, perhaps, for even larger operations to come. And of course, one of the perennial questions about secret intelligence in a democracy is how far you should go keeping things secret and maintaining, monitoring domestic citizens uh, in order to protect national security. That, that is a, a permanent challenge for a democratic intelligence agency, weighing up and reconciling the often contradictory claims of national security on the one hand and individual liberty on the other. So in an age where so much information is made public and is publicly available, will there be such a thing as secrets? Well, I think there'll always be secrets. You know, there's certain, there's a variety of, of things that make a secret, and one has to do with timeliness. Oftentimes, a fact only needs to be kept secret for a very short amount of time, and then the window passes, and then it can be made known, and it's not going to have the same impact. So there's always going to be that sort of thing. I think maybe what you mean is, you know, will, will there be timeless secrets? And I do think there probably are a few timeless secrets, secrets that maybe nobody really needs to know or won't need to know for a very long, long time. And those are the things that really intrigue us, isn't it? To wonder what those secrets might be. New technologies, new alliances, new threats. Who knows what the future holds for the secret world of espionage? In a time of rapid change and great uncertainty, there's only one thing we can count on, that as long as there are secrets, there will always be spies.